It is well known that the Fuhrer and his lover, Eva Braun, who is seated here beside him, married in their Berlin bunker towards the final days of World War II. A lesser known fact is that forensic scientists managed to extract Eva Braun's DNA from hair left on her hairbrush, which was taken from Hitler's mountain retreat by a U.S. Army captain in 1945. Surprisingly, scientists found a sequence within Braun's mitochondrial DNA that corresponds to Ashkenazi Jews. Mitochondrial DNA is passed from generation to generation down the mother's line, and Jewish tradition dictates that anyone born of a Jewish mother is themselves Jewish, which is articulated on the website Chabad.org about the maternal descent in Judaism. Quote, the code of Jewish law clearly states that a child of a Jewish mother is Jewish, regardless of the father's lineage or whatever else may show up in a DNA test, while the child of a non-Jewish mother is not Jewish. End quote. That said, I'd like to play a brief clip of Gertrude Braun, Eva Braun's cousin, who was interviewed as part of a Channel 4 documentary exposing the family secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. It's very difficult for me, but... Um, I didn't talk to anybody else. Maybe we have a Jewish root from my grandfather, from the mother's side. So Eva and me are also of Jewish origin. But for me, it wouldn't change anything. The name of my grandfather is a name that is well known in Israel too, Kronburger. But I don't uh, look for the roots because if I was uh, the mistress of Hitler, I am looking for my. And so I am not uh, researching to find out whether, oh, Eva is a, a Jewish. I want to know when I am Jewish, then I accept it. And Eva is part of our family, so of course she is also Jewish. A Channel 4 spokesman said, quote, In the 19th century, many Ashkenazi Jews in Germany converted to Catholicism, so Eva Braun is highly unlikely to have known her ancestry. Despite research he instigated into Braun's race, neither would Hitler. End quote. That said, the mass conversion of many thousands of European Jews into Catholicism can be traced to the self-proclaimed Jewish Messiah of the 18th century, Jacob Frank, who incidentally also had a daughter named Eva and who was the successor to Sabbatai Zevi, who proclaimed himself Messiah a century earlier in 1666 by proclaiming that redemption was available through acts of sin, which included abandoning traditional dietary laws, endorsing sexual promiscuity, and entering into Kabbalistic trance-like states of consciousness, which were not part of the orthodox, rabbinical, or mainstream Talmudic sects of Judaism. In fact, Jacob Frank, who incidentally was instrumental in the formation of the Illuminati in 1776, along with Adam Weishaupt, and Mayor Amschel Rothschild was responsible for burning thousands of Talmuds in Poland as he was a follower of the Zohar, a Kabbalistic text, illustrating the point of a rift and civil war within Judaism itself at the time. Of course, it is well known in esoteric circles, secret societies, and mystery school religions that the Kabbalah, along with its symbols, such as the famous Star of David, or Seal of Solomon, preceded Judaism. In the book Morals and Dogma, written by 33rd degree Freemason Albert Pike, it states that the Oriental, or Aryan Kabbalah of the Magi, the astronomer-priests of ancient Babylon, predates and was later adopted into Jewish mysticism, which was then integrated, encoded, and disseminated into other religions around the world after the Jews were freed from captivity by Cyrus the Great during the 6th century BC. 
allegedly originating during the time of Atlantis. What became known as Kabbalah also appears in esoteric Christianity as Gnosticism, as practiced by sects such as the Essenes, Cathars, Templars, Rosicrucians, and Freemasons. Hermeticism in Egypt, alchemy in Europe, parts of esoteric practices of certain Sufi sects of Islam, the Mithraic rites of the priesthood of the Zoroastrian faith, and the ancient mystery schools of Greece. The Chaldean Kabbalistic influence of the Magi also went on to influence Plato, which is acknowledged by Albert Pike, who said in his book Morals and Dogma, quote, the occult science of the ancient Magi was concealed under the shadows of the ancient mysteries. It was imperfectly revealed, or rather disfigured, by the Gnostics. It is guessed at under the obscurities that cover the pretended crimes of the Templars, and it is found enveloped in enigmas that seem impenetrable in the rites of the highest masonry. Magism was the science of Abraham and Orpheus, of Confucius and Zoroaster. It was the dogmas of this science that were engraven on the tables of stone by Hanok and Trismegistus. Moses purified and reveiled them, for that is the meaning of the word reveal. He covered them with a new veil when he made the Holy Kabbalah, the exclusive heritage of the people of Israel, and the inviolable secret of its priests. The mysteries of Thebes and Lucius preserved among the nations some symbols of it, already altered, and the mysterious key whereof was lost among the instruments of an ever-growing superstition that still and ever conceals from the profane and ever preserves to the elect the same truths. It was this same remembrance, preserved or perhaps profaned in the celebrated order of the Templars, that became for all the secret associations of the Rose Cross, of the Illuminati, and of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason of their strange rites, of their signs, more or less conventional, and, above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. The Gnostics caused the Gnosis to be prescribed by the Christians, and the official sanctuary was closed against the high initiation. The hermetic science of the early Christian ages, cultivated also by the Arabs, studied by the chiefs of the Templars, and embodied in certain symbols of the higher degrees of Freemasonry, may be accurately defined as the Kabbalah, an act of realization, or the magic of works. Its religious realization is the durable foundation of the true empire and the true priesthood that rule in the realm of human intellect. Its philosophical realization is the establishment of an absolute doctrine known in all time as the holy doctrine and which Plutarch speaks at large but mysteriously and of the hierarchical instruction to secure the uninterrupted succession of adepts among the initiates. The primary tradition of the single revelation has been preserved under the name of Kabbalah by the priesthood of Israel. The Kabbalistic doctrine, which was also the dogma of the Magi and of Hermes, is contained in the Zohar. Magic is that which it is. It is by itself, like the mathematics, for it is the exact and absolute science of nature and its laws. Magic is the science of the ancient Magi. Tradition also gives these magi the title of kings because initiation into magism constitutes a genuine royalty and because the grand art of the magi is styled by all the adepts the royal art.
which brings us to the esoteric beliefs of nationalist socialist Germany, an overtly Christian movement based on tenets of the Bible, as the German Chancellor was himself Catholic, which is why he allegedly did not drink or smoke. However, also believed that the historic biblical narrative had been hijacked in order to further a political agenda amongst Europeans. There was also an occult revival in Austria and Germany during the late 19th and early 20th century, inspired by historical Germanic paganism that can be also linked to ancient Aryan mysticism, which was brought into Europe by the Templars, who allegedly acquired treasure in the form of sacred texts during their stay in Jerusalem at the time of the Crusades. The Knights Templar, also known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, were technically a military order of the Catholic faith, created by the papacy, but later accused of heresy and sexual misconduct. They were considered practitioners of the Kabbalah, which sprang up in Europe in southern France in the 1300s after they were dissolved, surviving and re-emerging in Jewish and Islamic communities, which later influenced Germanic secret societies such as the Thule Society. We're talking about a movement that adopted an occult symbol, the swastika, as its flag. And uh, most of its outlook was derived, it's pretty clear, it derived from the occult. And then, of course, most of his leading most of the leading personalities of the Nazi party, particularly people like Himmler, were undoubtedly uh, devoted to the occult. I mean, the SS was an occult organization. Uh, Rudolf von Sebettendorf, who was the founder of the Tula Society, uh, traveled to Turkey, where he learned Kabbalah from a Turkish Jewish family from Salonika. So the Tula Society was responsible for the founding of the, the German Workers' Party, Founded that it eventually changed its name to the Nazi Party. <clears throat> so they were through and through at the core, the source of the Nazi movement and its ideology, which again was, it goes back to the Kabbalah. But what's important is that the Salonika in Greece was also the uh, base of the uh, Sabbatian movement. And so in particular, Sabatin Torth got introduced to the Sufism of the Bektashi, and the Bektashi were... What happened to the Sabatian movement is that after Shabtai Zvi converted to uh, Islam, his followers followed him in his conversion, and it became a sect known who exists to this day, a very peculiar community, because they uh, practice Islam in public, but practice Kabbalistic Judaism in secret. And so this was this was the network that um, Sabotendorf was affiliated with, all dealing effectively with the same core idea, which is the survival of an occult tradition uh, that began in Babylon in 6th century BC, uh, later known as the Kabbalah, but also uh, in its various transformations as the Western occult tradition. And I've been following that at different uh, stages in our history. Uh, so from the earliest times to manifestation as modern day fascism, most of them were members of the Thule Society. And it's a well-known fact that the, the Nazi party was an outgrowth or renaming effectively of the German Workers' Party, which was created by the Thule Society. So the Aryan occult tradition um, culminates in the founding of the Thule Society by Rudolf von Sebettendorf, who, before founding this order, uh, was studying Kabbalah with a Jewish family in, the Sabakian Jewish family in Turkey, and uh, then comes back to Germany and creates the Thule Society with this mythology about this, the Aryan race originating in Thule, which is effectively another name, name for uh, Atlantis. And so what's strange is that Edward Bulwer Lytton, who was uh, initiated into the Frankfurt Uden Lodge and then became the central figure of the occult revival. There's two principal influences behind the Nazi movement, and that's Edward Bulwer Lytton and Helena Blavatsky, who basically created the sort of modern mythologized 
uh, version of the Aryan race. And it was um, Bulwer Lytton's uh, novel, The Coming Race, and the idea of a Vril, which inspired the Nazis and, of course, the founding of what's supposedly the Vril Society and the, and the Thula Society. And it was is basically it was that movement that Bulwer Lytton gave birth to, which eventually evolved in the creation of the Golden Dawn. To make another shortcut, because we're not going to be able to, to talk about all these points together, but coming out of this Weimar network of German romantics, which gave birth to the elements that gave rise to German nationalism, it started to evolve over the entire length of the uh, 19th century. And at a certain point, this is where Wagner enters into the scene, and he plants in a very important element and really begins the sort of focus on anti-Semitism. But uh, because now you're looking at what happens, is this is around the same time that um, the idea of even the term itself, anti-Semitism, is introduced. Because until that point, until 1880, there was an anti, because it was that year that there was a famous anti-Semitic petition that was written, which was based on the idea, which rejected the idea that Jews could be identified as a religion and that they should be identified as a race. But when you look at the participants in that petition, most of them were uh, linked to the Frankists, because at the core, the Frankists are anti-Jewish. From the beginning, they uh, they rejected the Talmud, again, I said, in favor of the Zohar, and they practiced a religion which was basically heavily opposed to Orthodox uh, tradition. So they are effectively, is a civil war within the Jewish movement, and uh, so they were out to sideline Orthodox Judaism, and they managed to gain prominence, again, I said, through the financial support of the Rothschilds. What you're seeing is that basically there's parallel traditions out of the same origin from Moses Mendelssohn and the Frankists. One trajectory ended up through uh, Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, and Zionism, and the other one through people like Wagner, Edward Buller Litton, and Blavatsky to the Nazis. When you look at the especially right up until modern times, you look at the history of the Kabbalah, it's based on the belief that the the the, the sons of God, uh, or the Anunnaki, the Anakim, uh, were offspring of the sons of God and human beings. And so that this this uh, this superior race, they're, they're called in the Zohar, they're called, in fact, in the Bible, they're called the mixed multitude. And it's the Zohar that associates them with the, the sons of God. And so the this mixed multitude is the Aryan race. So as, as paradoxical as it might seem, the whole concept of the Aryan race is actually a Kabbalistic uh, myth of Jewish, you know, occult Jewish supremacy. And so uh, it's the belief that they are, are semi-divine because they are uh, offspring of the fallen angels. And on the, on the Christian side, these would be the IE sons of God, the descendants of these IE spirits and humans, right? Yeah. And okay. more than that, it's basically the fundamental Kabbalistic belief is that the sons of God uh, created a race of, uh, of beings that, sorry, a race of superior humans who have been preserving the ancient wisdom ever since. Oliver Pike uh, <laughs> was a proponent of, the, of, of Aryan theories. He later became a member of the Theosophical Society, which, of course, was headed by Blavatsky, who was the most recent proponent or, you know, elaborator of the of the Aryan myth, the mythology that the Aryans are uh, survivors of Atlantis, who are originally descendants of the sons of God, Anakim Anunnaki, who had preserved the ancient wisdom, quote unquote, Kabbalah, uh, since that time, because. It, this is where you get the development of this concept called the Oriental Kabbalah, which is the idea that the Kabbalah began in Tibet or uh, Asia before it was adopted by the uh, by the Jews. And so the claim is that the story of the flood represents Atlantis, and when Atlantis sank, a uh, number of the descendants of the fallen angels, who from then on were referred to as Aryans, traveled and settled, landed in the mountains of Asia. And that's where they spread their ancient teachings. And this is why supposedly uh, Tibetan Buddhism uh, represents a survival of the ancient um, uh, magical, the ancient, the magical teachings, teachings. which is represented by the survival of the swastika 
uh, in various uh, parts of the world. So they settled in India, they settled in Persia, and they settled in uh, Europe. And this is where supposedly you have the origins of the so-called Aryan race. And that's fundamentally the Kabbalistic um, legend. Right. And Iran is like the root word is based on Aryan. You know, most people are used to uh, dealing with all kinds of political topics today as sort of, you know, the, the elements of the intellectual discussions of our time. So is democracy or liberalism and fascism and communism, uh, and capitalism and feminism, all the isms and schisms. But what's happening now in Israel should make people, it should help realize that uh, all these are basically just distractions and that the, the, the events, the true events, the true foundational events of our time are being spearheaded by people who basically are the original protagonists of the Bible. Effectively, the events are, that are happening right now are proving that, you know, the, 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 the true hidden architects of our time are not Hindus, they're not Buddhists, right? they're not Taoists, they're not pagans. They're, they are the inheritors of the a story of the Bible, the protagonist of the Bible. It is understood in several elite secret societies, such as the Freemasons, that the Revelation chapter of the Bible is one part of what is regarded in such organizations as the Great Work, a blueprint behind many of the seemingly unrelated geopolitical events taking place in the world, which in fact are planned and orchestrated to bring about an ancient prophecy that has been in the planning through many generations. And though not yet written in stone, it is now in its final stages that we are now entering. Of course, these plans can still be altered or undone, no matter how long they've been in the making, as there's still an internal struggle taking place within occult organizations for what the new era will look like. While the prophecies call for a golden age of peace and freedom for mankind, there is still a small but well-funded sect that envisions a totalitarian, global order whose interpretation of peace is through centralized ownership, censorship, and control. While many people are familiar with the biblical passages referring to God's chosen people, this has in relatively recent times been assigned as an ethnic designation to a certain modern demographic where in an original esoteric context Israelite was a name given to Hebrew adepts meaning a branch of a Chaldean or Mesopotamian civilization considered a sub-race of the present Aryan root race also associated with the Babylonian and Egyptian civilizations of the time that underwent an initiation into the mysteries where they symbolically died and were reborn, in regards to their ego, meaning they transcended or expanded their consciousness, attaining a certain spiritual liberation, allegedly enabling them to behold divinity, the Messiah within, directly with their internal spiritual eyes, or third eye, which is something that is attainable to all people of all ancestry, all blood types, both genders, and all races. While a Jew is regarded as a member of the tribe of Judah, its symbol, the lion, which speaks to the exalted state of the sun, an alchemical emblem of spiritual gold, many modern Hebrews only retain a faint physical or shallow cultural link to the past, having all but abandoned the divine wisdom they were entrusted with as custodians in favor for atheism and communism. One needs only to look at the line emblems that are on the coat of arms of many European nations to see the ancestral link that once spanned the continent, which is also represented by a serpent, an ancient symbol of esoteric wisdom, which is found worldwide, from Mesoamerican cultures of Mexico, the native cultures of North and South America, including the shamans of Peru, to China, India, and Tibet, which once also shared an ancient shamanistic tradition that gave rise to Taoism and 
Buddhism and can still be found among some Mongolian shamans who transcend the conscious mind to attain the experiential wisdom from within, or Sophia, practices that the Islamic Sufis imparted to the Templars. To be chosen to the initiate did not suggest a supremacist, competitive, or hierarchical stance against any other adversary except one's own ego, which, when conquered, reveals the truth to the adept that every one of us stems from the same source, separated and alone in the physical, which is the illusion, united and together in the spiritual, which is the real truth. I recently showed up to an event in LA unannounced last weekend by myself since it was in my neighborhood where many researchers came together to discuss fringe topics that often go ignored in the mainstream. While it was my first conference that I attended and was not scheduled to speak, I found myself on a panel and got my feet wet so to speak as well as making some new friends along the way. In the coming months I plan to attend more this time as a scheduled speaker, and we'll post the dates and locations to my Patreon and various social media accounts, which should be linked in the description. I enjoyed all the positive feedback from the attendees, had a great time meeting many other researchers who were very enthusiastic and supportive towards my work, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of you in the near future as well. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.